everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome back to Virology. I'm glad to see most of you returned. I didn't scare you away last time. Today we're going to start really learning about viruses. The first half of this course, first 12 lectures or so, we're going to look at how viruses reproduce in cells, mostly in the laboratory. That's where these results have come from. And viruses, of course, don't just reproduce in cells in the lab, they reproduce in us and every living thing on the planet. And that'll be the subject of the second half. We'll talk about how viruses get into hosts and cause disease, immune responses, and so forth. Today I wanna to talk about the infectious cycle, which is another name for what happens when the virus gets into a cell. One announcement, so the TAs, Claire and Tyler, are going to do office hours in addition to mine. So mine is gonna be on Thursdays, 11 a.m. Uh, by Zoom, and theirs will be Tuesdays, 11.30 in Fairchild 900 in person, okay? So if you can't make mine, you can go to theirs. And if you can't make either one, just email us and we'll figure something out for you. We don't wanna leave you out. All right, the infectious cycle. This is a cell and it's being infected by a virus. The virus gets inside the cell. Remember, that's the part of the definition of a virus. It has to get into a cell. Can't do anything unless it gets in a cell. And then everything that happens, a whole series of steps happen. And then in fact, that's the subject for the first half of this course. We're gonna go through all of those steps so you understand what happens. It's amazing, all the different steps that occur, which take that cell and convert it to a new organism, a virus infected cell, which is very different from the cell before. And so that whole series of events from the virus touching the cell and getting in and doing all the things inside and eventually making more virus particles, that is called, that's what we call the infectious cycle. We also call it virus reproduction but it's basically everything that happens in a cell. And remember, when you are infected with a virus, this is what's going on inside of you, except in many, many different kinds of cells. Now, in this course, every lecture is a part of this cycle. For example, there's attachment and entry, there's DNA synthesis, RNA synthesis, and so forth. We divide this infectious cycle into steps to make it easier to study. It's like many other things in science, you make it simpler in order to study it, but in reality, there are no artificial boundaries, of course, uh, during an infection. This is just a human construct, if you will. Now let's define some terms. Throughout this course, I'm gonna use words in a very specific way. And you may say that I'm pedantic. You can, you're welcome to call me pedantic if you wish. I like to just say, the word I use today has to be the same in three weeks or four weeks or six weeks, all right? That's the whole point. I don't use a word today in, in one way and it means something different in the future. That's, that's actually a key to science, that words should mean the same thing, at least in different fields. And so here, uh, for the infectious cycle, there are some very important terms that you need to know, which you may have different definitions for. So first of all, a susceptible cell. When I say to you a cell, not a host, a cell, if it's susceptible, all that means is it has a receptor for the virus. We'll see next week that in order for viruses to get into cells, they need to bind to receptors on the plasma membrane. Most viruses, there are some exceptions which we'll talk about. And so a susceptible cell, has a receptor, that's all it means that the virus can bind to because that's the first step in infection. Now a resistant cell has no receptor. That's all there is to it. Susceptible has a receptor, resistant does not. Then we have the, thir the, the third word which is permissive. For viruses in cells, this means the cell can replicate the virus. A permissive cell can replicate it. It doesn't mean anything about susceptibility. It doesn't have any implications for receptor. It's, it's standalone property. Permissivity is what happens inside the cell beyond the receptor. 
So a susceptible cell may or may not be permissive. If, you, if a virus attaches to a receptor on a susceptible but not permissive cell, new viruses won't be made. So this is very important because in the big world out there, many people think if a cell has a receptor, then it's going to be infected. No, that's not the case. It has to be permissive. A resistant cell that doesn't have a receptor could be permissive, but you might not know because the virus can't get in on its own. How would we know this? Because we can extract nucleic acid from virus particles. We can get rid of all the, sh the casing, just take DNA or RNA, and we can introduce it into cells experimentally by a process called transfection. So the DNA, the RNA gets in cells, it can initiate an infectious cycle. And if the cell is permissive, new virus particles will be produced. So that's how we can tell if a cell is permissive or not, even when it doesn't have a receptor. Yes. Aha, yes. What causes a cell to not be permissive? Many, many, many things. You know, the, cell, the virus is completely dependent on the cell for every aspect of reproduction, right? It needs energy, it needs transport, it needs molecules, small molecules, nucleotides. So if any of those are slightly different from cell to cell, and there are big differences, say a neuron versus an epithelial cell, very different. So that would be it. We're actually gonna talk about that in more detail in the receptor lecture. And so this susceptible and permissive cell is the one that the virus can attach to, it can get in. It can re reproduce and make more virus particles, okay? Now we're gonna use susceptible in a slightly different way when we talk about hosts, but for the next 12 lectures, susceptible and permissive have these definitions, okay? So you, you should remember those. Now in the beginning of virology, there were no cells in culture that we have today. Nobody knew how to grow cells in culture. Early 1900s, people had no clue, so they used animals. They would inoculate an animal with a virus. They'd find an animal that could be infected with the virus and the virus would reproduce in it. And then they'd let the virus incubate in the animal. And then because there were no freezers either in the early 1900s, they would take the animal, harvest the virus, and then infect another animal and another and another and just keep doing that for years and years and years. And, and there are many different kinds of animals that were used as shown here. Some of them are more commonly used like mice because <clears throat> they can be inbred and genetically homogeneous. Now, as you might think, passing a virus from animal to animal, this is what I just told you. You infect an animal, you harvest the virus, you infect another, we call that passing it. That's just a street word, right? Passing, but in virology, it has a very specific meaning, passage or passing. That can select for viruses that have different properties from the one you started with. We're gonna talk about evolution in the second half of this course, but essentially, when you grow a virus, you have many, many, many different DNA or RNA sequences in your virus stock. And if you pass a virus in a different host over and over, you may select for a different sequence than the one you started with. So this often gave people trouble by doing this. Fortunately, we learned how to grow cells in culture eventually. Now in the beginning, we also knew, we also realized we could grow viruses in eggs and specifically embryonated chicken eggs. Now when you go to the supermarket and buy an egg, there's no embryo in it. It's not supposed to have an embryo anyway. If you crack one open and you find one, ah, it's not, it's not right because they're not supposed to be fertilized. But uh, you can buy embryonated chicken eggs. There are companies that sell them and you can inoculate them with viruses and they will grow in the egg. And they can grow in a lot of different places. The egg is a complicated thing and it can grow in all these different places. You don't need to know any of that. You just need to know that you can grow viruses in eggs and you can grow a lot of different viruses. <coughs> Nowadays, we don't use eggs except for influenza virus. We grow influenza virus in eggs. It's convenient and for vaccine production for years, it's been very convenient to grow influenza virus in eggs. And so here is a production facility for influenza virus. You know, the eggs are in racks. These machines automatically inject 
the eggs with influenza virus, and then hundreds of thousands of eggs are incubated, and after so many days, the, the fluid is harvested. When you get a, a flu shot, if you get the egg-grown flu vaccine, they're now cell-grown and egg-grown, you're getting about one egg's worth of shot in your arm. So this is really the only virus for which we do that. For other viruses, we use now cells in culture. And this was first figured out in uh, 1949 when Anders, Weller, and Robbins, working at Harvard Medical School, figured out that they could take poliovirus and grow it in cells in culture. They had made cells from embryonic tissues. They put poliovirus on it, it grew. It's the first time that this was done and they got the Nobel Prize for that a few years later. He was on the cover of Time magazine and um, it revolutionized virology because now everyone started studying viruses in cells instead of animals and much easier to do. And much of the information I'm gonna give you in the next 12 lectures came from studying the infectious cycle in cells and culture. So what do I mean by cells and culture? We can grow cells in dishes or flasks in the laboratory. I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. And they grow as a sheet on the surface of the plastic. We call that a monolayer <clears throat> because it's typically a layer of one cell thickness. And here are some examples of different kinds of cells that we use. Um, th there are what we call primary cells and cell lines. So if you take a primary cell, a very common one is a foreskin fibroblast because they're thrown away every day in hospitals throughout the world and you can go get them if you want them. And we used to do that up at our lab and you can go and get them and then you bring them back, you dissect them to make single cells, you chop them up, treat them with trypsin and then you put them on a plastic dish and they grow in a monolayer. So those are primary cells, which means they're made from the tissue, but they have a finite lifespan. They won't divide forever. That's the way cells are. They don't divide forever. This is good because if cells divide forever, that is cancer. We'll talk about that later. So those cells are great, but you're limited in your use because you can't go more than say a month. So people have found ways to make them immortal and so, for example, we have mouse fibroblast cell lines. When you have cell line in, in the name, it means they're immortal. They will live forever. They will outlive every one of you because you put them in the freezer and you can pull them out when you need them. There's the HeLa cell line, which is a famous human epithelial cell line. Um, those are all immortal cell lines, but they're not normal. They have too many chromosomes. They're basically abnormal cells, so you have to be careful what kinds of experiments you do in them. So for example, we can't grow vaccine viruses in cell lines because they're basically cancer cells and you don't wanna inject people with DNA potentially from a cancer cell. So for growing vaccines, we have more normal cell strains like diploid cell strains that have the normal number of chromosomes. They last longer than primary cells, but um, they are normal in their chromosomal content. So here's a, a photo from my lab to show you what I'm talking about. Here on the left, here, here's an incubator, a 37 degrees Celsius incubator where we have dishes. These are six centimeter dishes. These are flasks here. And then there are six well plates or multi well plates. Each of them are plastic. They have a, a, a flat bottom and the cells attached to them. And you cover them with some medium that gives them nutrients. You keep it warm and you also have CO2, 5% CO2 as a buffer that keeps the pH normal. And on the right is what we call a spinner. If you need a lot of cells, you can grow them in suspension. Uh, this is a flask where there's a magnet here that can spin and then it's sitting on a, another uh, device, a spinner we used to call them, that has a magnet in it and it will spin and, and spin this and keep them suspended. And the advantage there is that you can grow more cells than you could ever fit in your incubator. So if you need a lot, that's what I mean by cells in culture. Now, HeLa cells, of course, are very famous. They were this is the, the subject of this book by uh, Rebecca Sklut. Who's read, the, who's read this book? Anyone? Yeah, it's a great book. 
you should read it. And I mentioned a few times in it. I don't know if you noticed that, probably not. You should go back and reread it. <laughs> because she actually found me by searching and she said, would you read my manuscript for scientific accuracy? So I did it and she got to know the podcast and everything. So she um, uh, mentions me a few times, which is very nice because we get a lot of listeners. But anyway, Rebecca, uh, Henrietta Lacks uh, was diagnosed with cervical cancer in the 50s and she eventually died, but a piece of her tumor was removed and they were used to start HeLa cells. The first time that anyone made a, a, a immortal human cell line. And why she, her cells were good for that, we're gonna talk about later when we talk about how viruses cause cancer and you'll see exactly how um, uh, this virus causes cancer. So she had, a, she had a human papillomavirus infection, which is a sexually transmitted virus and back then we didn't know about it and it caused her tumor. We'll talk about how that works later on. All right, let's see if I can get the uh, quiz to work properly now. And we, then we have a question with two blanks. A blank and blank cell is the only cell that can take up a virus <laughs> particle and replicate it. So you have to fill in the blanks. So we have naive and resistant, primary and permissive, susceptible and permissive, susceptible and naive, continuous and immortal. Only one of those is right. And boom, we see how you did. And this is 99%. It's very good, that's the right answer. Susceptible and permissive. And only maybe one person picked susceptible and naive. That's very good. But you're not at 100%. It usually takes like lecture four before you get 100%. So we'll see if you're better than uh, previous years. Okay, maybe later today, who knows, right? Now, when we infect cells with viruses in culture, most of the time, the viruses cause changes in the way the cells look. We call that cytopathic effect. There are all different kinds of cytopathic effects. I'm showing you one here. This is a monolayer of cells that is infected with poliovirus. It's the virus I worked on for ages in my laboratory did a lot of these experiments. And so this is time zero. See, lovely cell monolayer. When I say lovely, I mean, they look normal, they're flat, their cells are touching each other. You can see each individual cell, this is a light micrograph. And then four hours after infection, you see some changes, right? Some cells are round where you didn't see so many round cells. And then eight hours, most of them are no longer attached, right? Very clear, and then, 12 hours, most of them have broken. Yeah? So does this also, this also comes with functional changes, right? Or is it just a, this is like a visual? All right, so the question is, along with these visual changes, are there functional? And yes, absolutely. There are metabolic changes in the cell, cell structure that you don't see here, for sure. They're both, and we'll talk about some of those as well. Yeah. So the question is, are the changes intentional? Well, of course, there's no intent. Better way to put it would be, are they functional, right? So th the breaking of the cells probably releases the viruses from the cells. And we'll see other kinds of CPE certainly have function as well, yeah. The, the, the um, detachment from the monolayer, I think that reflects changes in the cytoskeleton that occur by virus infection, which have other purposes as well, so I think, I think everything has a, a function in a virus infection. All right, so let me show you how this was used. Cytopathic effects, infecting cells in cell culture, was used to identify the virus that started the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, in early 2020. <coughs> so this was one of the first publications uh, from uh, China. Uh, Zhang Li Shi, the senior author, whom I know, she's a coronavirologist at the Wuhan Institute for Virology. And um, she published this paper, a pneumonia outbreak associated with a new coronavirus of probable bat origin. First month of the pandemic, probable bat origin. It still is a probable bat origin, folks. Not made in a lab, not released from a lab. It's of bat origin. Don't let any article tell you otherwise. 
So this is highlighted. Here we report the identification of a new coronavirus which caused an epidemic of acute respiratory syndrome in humans. So let me show you how they did this in, in steps. So they, they had patients with unusual pneumonia. They looked for other viruses and bacteria in them. They didn't find them. So what do you do? You go into the lung. You put a tube down into the lung. You squirt a little saline in and you suck it back out again. That's called bronchial alveolar lavage fluid, BALF. And then you take that fluid and you put it on cells in culture. So here we have a monolayer of cells, not a very good photograph, but you can see that this is an intact monolayer. They put the virus, they put the BALF fluid on it and they let it incubate. And then you see three days, after three days, clear cytopathic effects. They call them cytopathogenic, same thing. After three days incubation, you can see the cells are rounding up. There are now holes in the monolayer. So that's the beauty of CPE. You know right away that there is a virus there. And you have a control dish where you just use saline that's not gone into one of these patients. The best control would be saline from a healthy patient. Do you want me to squirt? Saline into your lungs? I don't think so. No, it's not a very nice procedure. You have to be intubated, right? So we don't usually have that. But this was the, night, this was the first indication that there was a virus involved. So uh, that's how that was done. Now, another kind of cytopathic effect is formation of syncytia. Syncytia is plural of syncytium, which means fused cells. So some viruses cause cells to fuse. So here we have... And this is the mechanism on the right. Let me tell you that first. So here we have two, an infected cell. So this infected cell has red Ys on the surface. Uh, that, that is the spike protein of, of the virus, which is being produced on the plasma membrane. And it's binding receptors on the next cell, which happens to be uninfected. And those two cells were, will fuse. And that can continue on and on until you get these very big cells with lots of nuclei. So you can count the nuclei and see how many cells fuse to give rise to that. So those are, that's a syncytium. And syncytia are multiple syncytium. So here on the left is a light micrograph of cells infected with measles virus. Measles gives characteristic syncytia. So does SARS-CoV-2, by the way. And you can see lots of individual cells. And here's a big cell with many nuclei, there's the arrow pointing it out. That is a syncytium. And you can get an idea what virus might be involved by seeing if the virus causes syncytia, either in patients, you could take a little epithelial cells from, from an infected patient and look for them, or cells in culture. So that's another kind of CPE, yes. So the virus can go from one cell to another without escaping the cell, so it doesn't see the immune system, okay? You also sat in the same chair, you know that, right? <laughs> I remember these things. So there are lots of different kinds of cytopathic effects. And they're listed here again. You don't need to know any of these, just to know that there are a lot of them and different viruses cause them. And if you work on a herpes virus, you get to know the kind of CPE that your virus forms. So for example, Rounding up and detachment of cells, we just saw that in the picture I showed you with poliovirus. And there can be all kinds of other, syncytium formation, chromosomes can be broken, et cetera. So just to let you know, there are a lot of different ways that cells change visibly after being infected. So the next, let's ask the question and answer it. How many viruses are in a sample? If I give you a tube of virus, and I say, tell me how many viruses are here. I'll tell you the way that we can do that. And there are two ways in general. We can measure infectivity. We can measure the ability of a virus to infect cells. And we can't do that for most viruses. And so for those, we use physical measurements. We can count particles and their components. So I want to give you examples of that uh, today. That's, by the way, a picture of my lab. I had someone who was just, would not clean up. And I used to say to her every day, can you please clean up? And she said, sure. But she got results, so what can I do, right? <laughs> you know, those tubes are all full of viruses, by the way. All those little Eppendorf tubes, they're full of viruses. Um, okay, 
So the first way to measure infectivity. So infectivity means we're actually going to ask how many viruses in a tube can start an infection. And the first is the plaque assay, which you've probably heard about before because you've, you've learned about bacteriophages. This was developed in the 1930s. This is a lawn of bacteria on an agar plate. So you, you take a, a culture of bacteria and you mix it with virus and you can use different dilutions of virus so that you can count the number of plaques. And then you spread the bacteria virus mixture on a agar plate, you put it in the incubator, the bacteria form a lawn. You know, just think of the, the person on the street, you, you tell them the bacteria form a lawn, they're like, do you use a lawnmower to cut it? <coughs> no, a lawn is just a covering of the agar to do that. And then whenever a virus infects a cell, the virus is killing the bacteria, so you get a clearing. And that's a plaque. And we can count them. And the assumption is that one infectious virus particle started that plaque, so we can count them and say, there are 10,000 plaque-forming units per milliliter in this virus stock that you gave me. So we call it plaque-forming units per mil. We don't say infectious viruses because because we're measuring PFU per mil. If we had some other way of measuring infectivity directly, we'd tell that, but we'd say infectivity. But this is an indirect infectivity assay. Yeah. The so the question is, what is the plaque? The plaque is a clearing of the bacteria. So the bacteria form the gray haze there. And then the, the clearing is because the virus has killed all the bacteria and you don't see them as a, as a monolayer any longer. Okay. And that's going to be the same theme for animal viruses. So the, bec the people who studied phages, they developed this assay first. Uh, and then, of course, the animal virologists wanted to get involved. And this was done in 1952 by Renato Dilbeco, uh, for which he got the Nobel Prize in 1975. You think, you know, for developing a plaque assay, it was revolutionary. It was a really important technique. And so here's the paper that he published. He was at Caltech, 1952. Production of plaques in monolayer tissue cultures by single particles of an animal virus. You'll see the word tissue culture sometime because they often started with a tissue. Now we don't, we have continuous cell lines so we just call them cell cultures. Uh, anyway, um, he, he talks about how he, he does this and um, in fact, he developed a plaque assay for, for poliovirus at the same time. And so here's how a plaque assay works. You take the tube of virus I gave you. I said, here, tell me how many infectious viruses are in this. You take that original tube, or which, which we call a virus stock, or you could take some BALF from a patient. Remember BALF? You could take that and do a plaque assay. You could do a, a nasal swab. I bet some of you did nasal swabs for, for COVID, right? Did you do the one where you stuck the swab into your brain? Yeah, <laughs> isn't that great? <laughs> so you could take some of that fluid and do a plaque assay as well. And then you make dilutions. You take 0.1 ml of your virus and then put it in a tube with 0.9 ml. So that's now a one to 10 dilution. And you just keep doing that over and over again. You have to know how well your virus grows. That will tell you how far out you have to dilute. You know, if you have a nasal swab, it's not gonna have very much virus in it, so you probably wouldn't go past 10 to the minus five. And then you take 0.1 ml of your dilutions and you add them to a monolayer of cells. You remove the medium from the cells, you add the virus, you put it in an incubator for 45 minutes to let the virus attach to the cells. And then you put medium on, or you don't just put any medium, you put agar overlay on, I'll tell you about that in a moment, uh, and incubate them and then after the incubation period, you remove the agar and you add a stain to the cells so that you can see the plaques where the virus has killed the cells. Now, if you don't know how well your virus is gonna grow, you would have to do plaque assay for all the dilutions. But after some time, you get to know it and you can pick your dilutions, which is what's shown here. So here we have <clears throat> three plates where one has too many plaques. They're they're fused together and you can't count reliably. So typically more than a hundred or so, too many to count. Or TMTC, TNTC. That's a famous word in bacteriology, too numerous to count. Uh, 
And then we have one with two plaques, which is, it, it's too variable. And then the middle is the one you want to count. It'll be between 10 and 100 plaques. It'll give you a nice reliable number. You count them, you have 17 plaques. So what was the dilution? Dilution is 10 to the minus six plus 0.1 ml. That's a 10 to the minus seven dilution. So we have 17 times 10 uh, to the ninth, to the seventh, sorry, 17 times 10 to the seventh, minus six plus one is minus seven. Then we just move the decimal point over to make it 10 to the eighth PFU per mil. So that's the titer. 1.7 times 10 to the eighth PFU per mil is the titer uh, of that particular virus. And it shows you, it's an indirect measure of infectivity, but it gives you a good estimate of how many infectious viruses are present. Yeah. Okay, is the, is the incubation time similar or different for different viruses? It varies widely. So for some viruses, the incubation, the, the one step, the growth cycle, right, where you put a, a virus enters a cell and then comes out, can be eight hours or can be days. So your plaque assays can vary from days to weeks. It depends on your virus and you have to find out ahead of time, yeah. So here's what a plaque looks like, just to show you what is going on. So here's a monolayer of cells, and we've expanded a small part of it. And when you, you put your virus dilution on, some viruses will infect single cells like there, and that cell will become lysed, has CPE. The virus will then spread to neighboring cells, and that area of lysis will get bigger and bigger. And that's the key for the agar overlay. The agar overlay, on, which is a semi-solid medium, right? It restricts the diffusion of the virus. If you put liquid on top of these cells, the virus would diffuse throughout the whole culture and infect every cell, and you would not be able to count plaques. So we use an agar overlay to restrict the diffusion and allow you to count plaques. And here's a microscopic view of a plaque. It may not be easy for you to see, but there's norm there are normal cells around the plaque here, and here the cells have detached from uh, the monolayer. Some viruses do not form plaques for various reasons. And sometimes we can put a gene in the virus that will give us a color under certain conditions. So here is a, a, a beta a gal, blue color in that particular virus, showing you again the uh, circumscribed nature of a plaque. So with incubation, the virus is spread outwards. But let me show you a movie of this. This is beautiful, are you ready? This is the greatest movie ever made. It's a single plaque formation. So they took a camera focused on a cell, a, a plate of infected cells. They found what looked like the beginning of the plaque and then they took time-lapse frames every so often. And this goes out to 15 hours, I think. And you can see the cells are dying and it gets bigger and bigger and the clearing is wider. And it's interesting that it goes out in a circle, right? It's like you drop a stone into a pond and the ripples go out in a circle. So that's the formation of a plaque. Um, yes, so you notice that this is a kind of microscopy called phase contrast. So it uses a special optics that allow you to see cells without staining them by optical contrast. And when the cells are infected and dying, their optical contrast changes. They become more, they become brighter, as you see. As a and that's what you're seeing as the um, cells die and it moves out. Those are changes in the refraction uh, of the cells. All right, that's a plaque assay. So uh, we used to do a lot of plaque assays in my laboratory. In fact, that is one plaque assay done by a postdoc, 1,675 six-well plates. These are each a plate of six little uh, wells. I built that in my office uptown. I called it the wall of polio. Uh, and we used to have office hours there. <laughs> in fact, this was a few years ago, one of the classes from this class who came and uh, stood in, and then people used to want to have their pictures taken in front of the wall of polio. In fact, some very famous people came and had their pictures taken, like the son of uh, Jonas Salk came and had his picture taken, and other people. But it, uh, it's, it's gone. Um, I thought of giving it to a museum, but I didn't want to deal with it. <laughs> so <laughs> when I left, um, I, I vacated my office, it was thrown away. But that's, that's very 
Plaque assays are great. I love them. I think they're the greatest assay ever developed because they give you so much information. <clears throat> okay, next question. When doing a plaque assay, what's the purpose of adding the semi-solid agar overlay on the monolayer? To stabilize progeny virus particles, to ensure that cells remain susceptible and permissive, to act as a pH indicator, to keep cells adherent to the plate during the infection, to restrict viral diffusion after lysis of infected cells. So 80% of you got the right answer, to restrict <coughs> viral diffusion after lysis of infected cells. So if you put liquid on, when the cell lysed, the infected cell lysed, the virus would spread throughout the culture, right? Because the liquid is not impeding diffusion. The agar doesn't allow the virus to diffuse. It keeps it exactly where it came out of the cell so it can just infect neighboring cells. So all the other explanations to stabilize particles, to ensure that the cells remain susceptible and permissive, to act as a pH indicator, to keep cells adherent, no. You know, the cells would remain adherent as long as they're not infected, but it's really to restrict uh, the diffusion. Okay, so we, we learned how to do a plaque assay, but in fact, is only one virus needed to form a plaque? Because if it is, then that means that a PFU is really an equivalent to an infectious virus particle. Uh, so let's, let's uh, answer that question. This, by the way, is a plaque assay uh, with influenza virus. It's uh, another virus you can do plaque assays with. You can see the nice dilution series. And so this middle one would be the one that you would count. <clears throat> so the way you figure out if a single virus particle is enough to make a plaque is you do a, uh, a dilution and count plaques. And that's displayed here. So here... On the x-axis, we have relative virus concentration. So that's your dilution. And then on the y-axis, the number of plaques. You just count them. And you can see that this virus, when the red has one, one virus is enough to form a plaque. We know this because it's a line. It's a straight line. Because when you double the concentration, you double the number of plaques. So that's called one-hit kinetics. So for one hit kinetics, the number of plaques is directly proportional basically to the concentration of virus inoculated. So that shows, and in fact, in that first paper by Dobeko that I showed you where he developed the plaque assay, I showed, he did this experiment to conclude that one, uh, in, one particle is enough to form a plaque. But it's not true for all viruses. Some viruses have two hit kinetics or more. You need more than one particle to infect the cell. So here's an example of a virus with two hit kinetics in blue, the curve. The number of plaques is proportional to the square of the concentration. You need more than one, so you get this parabolic curve. And there are viruses where you need three or four or five and more. In particular, plant viruses, you, you need like many, <coughs> seven or eight particles, sometimes each of which has a different part of the genome. Plants are different. They're kind of, all the cells are accessible. And so viruses don't need to be all in one particle. But for all the viruses we're gonna mainly talk about, it's one hit kinetic. So that means that one particle is enough to initiate an infection. And so we can, at, we can say that PFU is basically a, one infectious particle. And we often use this procedure to make pure stocks of viruses, you do a plaque assay, you take a pipette and remove the agar from the plaque assay, which has the virus in it, and re-plaque it, and you do three times to make a pure virus stock, especially if you wanna isolate virus, say, from a, a patient. You don't know what other viruses are there, so you wanna make sure you do this multiple times so that you have a, what we call a clonal stock of, of your virus. Now, not all viruses form plaques, so what do you do? There are other, approaches. This is called an endpoint dilution assay. And here, even though the virus doesn't form a plaque, it still causes CPE, which you can see in the microscope. And so you take multi-well plates, like this one is 96 wells, and you do dilutions of your virus, just like before, minus two, three, four, five, six, seven, and you infect 
all the wells in one row with the same dilution, minus two, minus three, minus four. And then you look for the dilution where about half, where half of the wells are infected, not about, where half of the wells are infected. And for this one, it's this one. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five out of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yes. Of course, I made this up to make it easy to see where the 50% endpoint is. In life, it never falls on one dilution. You will not get beautiful. So you have to interpolate between two dilutions, which is mathematically very easy to do. This is called an endpoint dilution assay, or TCID50, tissue culture, infectious doses, 50%. And this is often done, uh, this can be automated very readily. And so this is often done where you need to do a lot of these uh, at one time. Yeah, there's the 50% endpoint. All right, so for many viruses, you need one particle. One particle is sufficient to start an infection. But not every particle is infectious. It's a little subtlety there, okay? Many particles are just defective. They're not able to initiate an infection. And that's reflected in a property we call the particle to PFU ratio, which can be easily calculated. If you, know, if you have a tube of virus and you know the number of particles in it, which you can calculate by electron microscopy, and you divide it by the number of PFU, you get the particle to PFU ratio. So it's the number of physical particles divided by the number of infectious particles. And it turns out that this varies widely among viruses. And this is just a list of different viruses, but note here, for some viruses, every particle is infectious. And for others, only one in 10,000 are infectious. And some are in between, as you see. So it's another of the properties of the virus and, and why so many virus particles are made in an infected cell, because not only is it hard to find a host, but many of the particles are defective because making viruses is, a, is not an exact science. It's hard. There are a lot of steps. Here are some of the reasons. There are a lot of steps in the infectious cycle. So if you fail at any one step, you're not infectious. You can make damaged particles. So here's an electron micrograph of poliovirus. You can see a bunch of them are empty. They don't have a genome in them. Things go wrong. Some of the genomes are mutated, so they're not infectious. So some of the reasons why not every particle is infectious. And for, if for people who are studying viruses, you have to keep this in mind, because let's say you are <clears throat> studying an infection of a cell, <coughs> excuse me, by a virus, <coughs> and you're using uh, microscopy to study the infection. Well, you don't actually know that what's happening is caused by infectious or non-infectious particles. So you have to be aware of that when you're thinking about your experiments. Our next question, in the particle to PFU ratio, particle can best be described as one of the proteins of which makes up the virus, which makes up the virus, a virus which may or may not be infectious, a virus which is infectious, a virus which is not infectious, and elementary or composite. You know, that's just a joke, okay, that last one. Um, I couldn't think of another wrong one, okay? Um, so which of these describes particle? When I say particle to PFU, you know what PFU is, right? It's from the assay. What does particle mean? So yes, 80% of you got the right answer. A virus which may or may not be infectious, right? Particle means everything that's in there. So the, the way you calculate particles, you have to be able to look at the virus some way. It's hard, so you're not gonna be doing this every week but you count particles, you don't know which are infectious or not. The infectivity comes from the plaque assay. It's not one of the proteins, it's not the infectious virus, it's not the non-infectious virus. And I am glad none of you picked elementary or composite. Now, uh, let's use what we understand to describe the one-step growth cycle, which is a way to study that infectious cycle. Uh, this is actually a key point I mentioned last time, which showed that viruses are not simply small bacteria. This is called one-step growth cycle. This, it was developed in, in 1939 using bacteriophages. So what you do is you take your bacteria, you add virus, you let it 
attached to the cells. We call that adsorption for a certain amount of time, usually 45 minutes or an hour. And then you dilute the culture, which stops new attachment. Attachment happens best in a concentrated form. So you dilute it, you now stop attachment. So you've basically synchronized the culture. You've got all the viruses attached that are going to attach. And then you start sampling the culture to measure new virus particle production. And that's where we get the growth curve I showed you last time. You have uh, on the left a growth curve. So in this experiment, we're taking time points after we dilute the culture and we're measuring infectious particles by a plaque assay. So you can see with time, we get an interesting pattern. For a while, there is no new virus made. This is called the eclipse period because there, the genomes have come out of the, the virus particle, they're in the cell and they're directing the synthesis of new proteins which have to be built into new virus particles. And eventually, those start to come out of cells and you measure and you can get an uh, infectivity on a plaque assay. That we call the burst or the yield. And when all the cells are dead, you don't get any more virus. That's called a one-step growth curve because we've infected all the cells and they're all going through this infectious cycle uh, at the same time. You can add less virus so that not every cell in the culture is initially infected, and then you have multiple bursts. So you will have that first one where, say, 50% of the cells are releasing virus, and then that virus will go on to infect the rest of the culture. So this is the growth curve, and this is how you do it. We can do this for viruses of mammals as well. This is a growth curve for adenovirus, which is a virus we'll be talking about a lot. Again, these are hours after viral adsorption. So the bacteriophage example I showed you would be done in 40 minutes. And this takes many hours, as you can see, to get back to the point that every virus has a different growth cycle. We're measuring PFU per mil, and you can see there's an eclipse period, and then adenoviruses begin to be produced, and eventually they peak when the cells are all dead. We have one additional bit of information here, which is interesting. And that is if you measure the virus in the medium of the cell culture. So cells in culture sitting on a monolayer, you have medium on top. If you scrape the cells off and break them and measure virus, this is the curve that you get. So that's total virus production. But if you just take a little bit of the medium and you ask how much virus is in the medium, this is what you get here. It's called extracellular. And you see there's a delay between when the first virus is made and when it gets out of cells. So it just takes time for viruses to get out of cells. And that is called the latent period, the period between which you, you start to get, before which you get viruses in the medium. And the eclipse period is the period before which you get any virus produced at all in the cell. Yes? So, so the, why is there a decrease here early in infection? Right, so you absorb the virus, and then you take a time zero, and then the next time point is less. For many viruses, the interaction uh, with the receptor causes the genome to come out. So it's no longer infectious in your plaque assay. So you're seeing a reduction in infectivity caused by just attaching to cells. Yeah. And remind you, it's very different from bacteria. You put a single bacterium in broth, after just a few minutes, it begins to divide. There's no lag, there's no eclipse, there's no latent period, and it divides by binary fission. Very different for viruses. Now, uh, in a, in a one-step growth curve, we synchronize the cultures, I told you. And so to do that, you need to infect all the cells, and then you dilute the, the infection, as I said, so that no more attach. So how do you know all the cells are infected? How do you know how much virus to add? Well, the answer is a little bit of math, which is not hard at all, so don't be turned off. I'm not a math person, but this, this, is, this is pretty easy. It's called multiplicity of infection, MOI. This is the number of particles you add per cell. So you can calculate the MOI very easily by simply taking the amount of virus you add to a cell, culture, and divide it by the number of cells. So if you add a million PFU to a million cells, the MOI is one. It's really straightforward. So it's not the number of viruses that each cell gets, it's the number you add as an experimenter. There's another example for an MOI of 10. 
So why isn't it the same? Why isn't what you add what each cell gets? That's because virus infection is a random thing. What do I mean by that? You take a bucket of tennis balls and you've got a bunch of buckets and you throw them. So if you have 100 balls there, they're not all going to get 100 balls, right? They're going to get zero. They're going to get one, two, three, four. It's a random event depending on which ball goes into which bucket. And that's the same with viruses infecting cells. And the best way to describe that mathematically is by the Poisson distribution, which is shown here at the upper left. And it's the distribution of, say, how many viruses a particular cell would get if you add so many viruses to a culture. And so that's the formula at the top. PK is the fraction of cells infected with K number of virus particles. And so uh, e, of course, is the natural log. M is, is, is um, the multiplicity of infection. And so you can actually simplify that to this equation here, P0. So this is the number of uninfected cells would simply be E to the minus MOI. And remember, MOI, how many particles you add per cell. That's pretty easy. Cells getting one particle is P1, M, E minus M cells multiply infected is one E minus M, M plus one. And that is basically subtracting from one all the sum of all probabilities for any value of, of K, which is P zero and P one. So in, in reality, let's see how we would use this. If you use an, a million cells infected at an MOI of 10, and you use those equations, 45 cells are uninfected. So basically every cell in the culture is infected. So you, if, you're gonna get a nice one step growth curve out of that. Um, 450 get a particle, and most of the cells get more than one particle. So it's an MOI of 10. Very few are getting 10, but a lot are getting more than one. If you use an MOI of one, 37% are uninfected, 37% get one particle, and 26% get more than one. So if you did an MOI of one, you should see multiple steps in your growth curve, not just one. And then you can do an MOI of 0.001, and you can see most of the cells are infected. But if you are infected and you can uh, eventually, if you're patient and you let the cells incubate, you will see the whole culture infected. So that's, using different MOIs is useful because let's say you make a viral mutant and you're studying it in cells in the culture. If you do an MOI of 10, you may see no difference compared to wild type. But maybe at an MOI of 1 or 0.1 or 0.01, you would see a difference because the difference is subtle. So you go through multiple rounds of replication. OK, the last question for today is, uh, if cells are infected at an MOI of 10 in a one-step growth, in the growth you will see multiple bursts of virus release, multiple eclipse periods, a single burst of virus release, no burst of virus release, or asynchronous infection. So that is an MOI of 10. Yeah, you're gonna get a single burst, right? All the cells are infected, one, one round of replication. You're not gonna get multiple. You would get multiple with an MOI of one or less. Uh, multiple eclipse would be if you had multiple bursts. No burst, of course, you're not gonna get that asynchronous infection would only happen at a low MOI. So just remember, at MOI of 10, even five, if you do the math, you'll see that five and 10 give you every cell basically infected, synchronous infection. All right, so that, that was measurement of infectivity, physical measurement. There's a lot of ways we can do physical measurements. I'm just gonna go through a couple of these in detail, but basically you could, you could do what we call hemagglutination. We could use red blood cells to measure particles. I'll explain that in a minute. You could look at the viruses by electron microscopy. You can measure enzymes that are present in some virus particles. You can use antibodies to measure virus components. If you've done a rapid antigen test for a COVID infection, that's what we're doing there. And then we can actually look at the nucleic acids of the viruses and do sequencing. So hemagglutination can be done with just a few viruses. And it's possible because the receptor for the virus is also on red blood cells. The red blood cells don't support any virus reproduction. There's no nucleus in human red blood cells. There's no virus reproduction going on. But the red blood cells have 
on their surfaces receptors, carbohydrate receptors for many viruses, including influenza virus, which is shown here. So you can add influenza virus and it will cause the red blood cells to stick together because you see multiple viruses will bind to one red blood cell and then multiple red blood cells will, will stick to each other. And that makes something that you can see with your eye. So here on the top is an example. You do dilutions in 96 wells and you can see when, the, when there's a lot of virus present at low dilutions, the red blood cells make a sheet that coats the well. It's very clear because they're all, they're all forming a lattice, basically. And when there's less virus as you dilute it out, then the, then the red blood cells tumble to the bottom of the well and they make a button. So it's not, it's not hemagglutinating. And so you can, for example, in this dilution, I would say, one to five twelve is the last point where you're seeing hemagglutination, and then it stops. So that would be the titer, the HA titer of that particular virus. It just gives you a rough estimate of how much, how many virus particles are present. Remember, it's not an infectivity assay. Many viruses have enzymes in the particle. We're going to talk about many of those in this course. Uh, one example are retroviruses, which have in their particle an enzyme reverse transcriptase, which you can measure uh, by an assay. Here is a filter assay where we are looking at, we, we have run through the filter extracts of, of cell supernatants with the, a virus and with the dilution of it, and then used radioactive precursors to incorporate label. And you can see, you can measure the enzyme activity and they're there and not present in mock infected cells. Uh, you can use antibodies, as I said, to measure either, you can measure viral components, which we call, call antigens. You can also measure antibodies to the virus. So for, for, for COVID, we didn't do that a lot, but we, our rapid antigen tests, uh, we're measuring a viral protein. And so here on the left, we have an example where we take a plastic, basically a multi-well dish or, or a lateral flow format, which I'll show you, you add your antibody to it. It's called the capture antibody because it's gonna capture the viral protein. And then you use a second antibody to the viral protein which has some kind of an indicator so that you can see it very rapidly. And then if you're looking for antibodies, you put the antigen, the viral protein on the plastic and, that, and then you flow on top of it nasal wash or serum and that will capture the antibodies in the sample and then you use a second antibody which is against the first with an indicator. And this uh, on the left where you're looking for viral antigen, you could use for, for the COVID rapid antigen test, you can use a nasal swab to do that because the viral antigen would be present. And so this was used in that first paper I showed you where they found this new coronavirus uh, in the very early days of the COVID-19 outbreak. So they had those, remember they had those two in, panels of cells, uh, one with CPE and one without. And then they went back and stained them with antibody against the viral uh, nucleocapsid protein, the NP protein. And they had NP against a different coronavirus, but it cross-reacted sufficiently with SARS-CoV-2 that they got a signal. So here on the left, and what they do here is you take cells, you fix them, you remove the medium, fix them with say methanol, it permeabilizes the membrane so that the antibody can get inside the cell. Because if you don't do that, the antibody will not get inside the cell. And so then you can add the antibody and a second antibody that will give you a fluorescent signal. So on the left is the uh, control uninfected cells. They're stained with a dye called DAPI, which identifies DNA in the nucleus. So you can see their cells there. And then on the right is the sample of one of the infected cell cultures from a patient that where they added BALF to it. And you can see the red staining shows you where there is viral nucleocapsid protein. So that is another confirmation that there is a coronavirus present there. This is the format of the lateral flow assay. These are typically cartridges. You've seen them if you've taken rapid uh, antigen tests. It's the same format as a pregnancy test. You're looking for a particular uh, antigen. And the way it works, it has it has a, um, a, a, a absorbent pad on top of a plastic support. And then there are different reagents placed at different points in the pad. So right here, if we're looking for antigen, we're looking for, at a rapid antigen test, 
you put your clinical sample with antigen there and it begins to move by capillary action down the, the absorbent pad. And it first encounters a reagent where you have monoclonal antibodies to the antigen, which are conjugated to, in this case, colloidal gold. And that's, the gold is gonna make the line on the test, basically. Uh, all right, so if you're antigen in your sample, these antibodies will pick it up, they will continue to flow down. And you can see here now we have the antibodies with the antigen conjugated, they're moving down. And then the first line is the test line, which tells you if you're positive or not. And there are antibodies attached to the paper that will grab the antigen. And remember, the antigen is already taken by another antibody, which is linked to colloidal gold. That makes a nice black line in the assay because all those gold particles line up. That's what gives you the positive. It can be other things than colloidal gold. You can have other colors as well. And then there's a control line here to make sure the test is working. Because if you're negative, you don't know if the test works. So you need a control line. Over there, we have uh, antibodies uh, to the antibody. So you're going to have some antibodies uh, in you. Well, these antibodies actually are going to get captured by the control line and they will have colloidal gold on them. Whether or not they have antigen, it doesn't matter. We'll just show you that the uh, assay is working. Yes. Right. If a patient is COVID negative, then <clears throat> there, there will be no attachment uh, to that first series of antibodies because those are looking for the viral protein. So no protein, no attachment, but they will, the antibodies will attach to the control antibodies to show you that the test worked, right? Yes? Does the relative shading of the line say anything about infection? I know that was the thing. <laughs> I know, everybody thinks that, oh my, my line came up in five minutes and it's really dark. No, I don't think that has any, this is not a quantitative assay. Yeah. It's yes or no, right? So if you get a faint line, you're infected, yeah. Or you've got some antigen in you, whether you're infected or not is another question, which we can, talk about another time. Uh, we also use green fluorescent protein to detect viruses. Uh, GFP is originally isolated from a jellyfish, of course, and you can, you can add it to virus genomes or virus particles. Here on the left is a cell infected with HIV, and you can actually see the particles by light microscopy because when you incorporate a fluorescent protein, which glows under UV light, then it's bigger than the actual particle. It has a bigger target size for light microscopy. And that picture on the right is a cell infected with seven different herpes viruses, each of a different color. You can make many different colors of green fluorescent protein uh, and track viruses in that way. You can do sequencing of DNA. In fact, early in the COVID pandemic, many samples were sequenced. In fact, millions and millions throughout the pandemic were sequenced because we have a way of doing very, very rapid sequencing. When I was a postdoc, I sequenced the genome of poliovirus. This was 1980. It took me a year to sequence 7,400 bases. Today, you could do it in 10 minutes because of this technology, right? Don't, I, I, good thing I didn't know it back then, right? So we can do, and this is the way I did it, by reading gels with lots of bands on them. But nowadays, there are incredibly clever ways of doing multiply, multiple uh, samples in one tube and sequencing them very quickly. You know, the human genome was sequenced by the old technology, it took 10 years originally, $3 billion, and now you can sequence your human genome in one day for $1,000. It's really amazing. Anyway, we can apply this to, um, viruses, and now we can collect isolates from different patients, different places around the world, and we can compare their sequences, and we build these phylogenetic trees, which tell you the relatedness among all the different sequences. And we're gonna use this often uh, in this course. Basically, you take, in this case, 10 different isolate sequences, and you run them through a program which will say which two pairs are the most similar, and it will construct the tree Say these virus one and two are the most similar to each other, three and four are the most similar, and then you infer ancestors uh, to all of them and the x-axis would be the degree of genetic change. And you can do this now with a few sequences or tens of millions and there are websites where you can go to and look at all the tens of millions of SARS-CoV-2 sequences and build all kinds of interesting trees. And at the beginning of the SARS-CoV-2 outbreak, 
this is the same paper that I've been showing you. They built a phylogenetic tree of the isolates they had, and they found that it clustered with uh, other coronaviruses, which is more evidence that that was a novel coronavirus. We use polymerase chain reaction also to amplify DNA sequences. Uh, this takes, for example, a, a, an original sample of DNA and you incubate it with primers, you denature the DNA and make a copy of it. And so you go from one copy to two and then four and then eight, et cetera. So you have exponential amplification of a small amount of DNA so that now you can detect it. Uh, and this is based on using a thermostable DNA polymerase, which was originally discovered in a hot spring by a curious microbiologist uh, in the 1960s. However, there is a lot of misconception about what <coughs> PCR is and what it's not. PCR is not the same as infectious virus because typically we design primers that only amplify a small portion of the target. We never amplify the whole 30,000 base genome of SARS-CoV-2. We do 100 or 200 base sequence. So you don't know if there's infectious virus present. So here's an ex example. This is an experiment done with Zika virus where they infect mice. And this was at a time when it was found that uh, Zika virus was present in, in semen, so it could be sexually transmitted. So we infect male mice with Zika virus, and we take semen at different days after infection. And you do a plaque assay for infectious virus, and you can see after about 21 days, there's no more infectious virus. But the PCR positivity of the semen remains for many days, as you can see, because this is the way it happens with viruses. They infect, there's no more infectious virus, but there break down pieces of old virus particles around that continue to circulate. It's the same with antigens. You may have recovered from COVID, but you're still rapid antigen positive. It's just some virus particles that have hung around. They're no longer uh, infectious. And this is the same with SARS-CoV-2. This is a graph of a, an, a number of patients followed for multiple days after infection. You can calculate infectivity by a plaque assay here, and you can see infectivity lasts maybe 10 days, but the PCR positivity lasts much longer. So once again, PCR positivity is not a measure of whether you can transmit to other people. And this was a big problem early in the pandemic because no one understood that infectivity, or few people understood that infectivity is not the same uh, as, in, in fact, as PCR product. And I don't think it's well appreciated to this day because many of the recommendations on how long you should remain isolated after infection are based on PCR positivity or even antigen positivity, which are not measures of infectivity. No one has done a good study where they measure infectivity and see how long it lasts and more importantly, how much infectious virus you need to infect another person. All right, so next time we are gonna talk about viral genomes, what they look like and how you can study them.